Hello, Haygoers. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Uh, just so you know, I'm Ray Tessie. I am the owner of Neutral Zone Studios. I'm going to give you a little bit of a preamble as to what we're all about. Uh, we do have an interesting situation today in that we have a nor'easter that has come over Kingsland, Georgia. So we're going to do our best, but I think we've got a good show for you today. Uh, we want you to see what we're all about. We want you to see what we're all about. We're going to have other uh, walkthroughs as well, uh, one next Saturday and one the, the second weekend of December. And we're going to talk about a lot of the behind the scenes stuff. Uh, that goes on here, but today we're going to try to show you something a little bit different, something a little bit cool. Uh, let me just tell you a little bit about the studio. Uh, we started uh, probably in about 2009, 2010 at a very small location with a few sets. Uh, we moved here in 2011 or 12, uh, and everything you see has been built by volunteers. Everyone just for either the love of construction or the love of Star Trek has contributed. Uh, the big um, influence in building the studio was a gentleman named Vic Mignana. And if you're not familiar with Vic, he did 11 episodes here called Star Trek Continues. Uh, but in addition to Vic, and by the way, he took the blueprints from Paramount in 1966 and scoped out everything that you're gonna see. Uh, but in addition, there have been a total of 40 independent fan films that have been done here. Um, um, Starship Farragut, Dreadnought Dominion, Tales from the Neutral Zone, Avalon Universe, and a host of other independents. So we are an active film studio, and that's what we want to show you. We're not going to talk about too much of the behind-the-scenes stuff. I will tell you that this is Hollywood, so... Things that they did in the original series are the same way or work the same way that they do today. So our doors, Dan, if you would just show our doors, our doors are manual. I know you probably think you went to Target and saw doors open up automatically, but, you know, 55 years ago, that didn't exist. So we do everything here the way they would have done it in 1966. So without further ado... Let's get started. Let's take you through our uh, star base or our starship. And uh, we will uh, do a little bit of background talk every once in a while. But I want you to just take in everything you see. And doors. And welcome to engineering. Welcome, everyone, to engineering. So as you can see, this was built in the same style as the original engineering section. Uh, we have a warp core in the back. Uh, we're not going to give too much detail today, but that's built with something called force perspective. Uh, if we go in and we look up, we can see both that there's a, a second story ceiling, and we do have a second story for other crewmen. And you can see everybody kind of walking around pretending they're busy, and that's okay. So in the center, this island was an afterthought in uh, the original series. Uh, essentially, if you look at the first season, first few episodes, the island didn't exist. So they put this in to make it look like it somehow affected the warp core. The uh, dilithium crystal chamber is here. Uh, not everybody... And I'm just going to let you take it in just for a minute or so. Some of the things you see are still available today that they were 55 years ago. So uh, that grating that's in front of the warp core, as well as the red one that Dan just showed you on camera, uh, are actually still manufactured today. And that's a form of rebar. And that goes into large cement pours to keep the cement from uh, cracking or breaking. 
So if you ever see a large conduit that's holding up a road or a building, odds are that's what's inside. Solid steel, very heavy. Uh, the ceiling, which we looked at, is actually made out of styrofoam. So we tried making it out of wood, but the wood didn't do it. It was just too heavy. Uh, so we made it out of styrofoam. The crew that's here are all volunteers. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Linda. Yes, the crew is all volunteers. Everyone's a volunteer. If you guys are familiar with the CBS fan film guidelines, uh, which is probably now the Paramount <laughs> fan film guideline, uh, fan films cannot profit. Fan films cannot profit. So, uh, you know, we might take care of transportation, meals, uh, that's only fair. Uh, but everybody here is a volunteer. And uh, the people who did the construction, Linda, were all volunteers. Uh, a lot of the funding was done through Kickstarter uh, and I believe maybe some Indiegogo, but everything was made because of the love of Star Trek. And please guys, we love questions. So Dan is monitoring. I have Dan Scanlon behind the camera and he's monitoring. So if you have a question, he's gonna call out. All right, engineering. Let's go over to our main section. So here we are at what is essentially the main part of the ship uh, or the main part of our sets. Uh, I will tell you when these doors open, we have a lot of different reactions from people. We have laughing, we have crying, we have expletives, we have jumping up and down. Um, this is, again, we're a film studio, but this is really what you probably would have seen at Paramount in 1966 had you gone there. We're not going to show you it as a studio. We're going to show it to you as if you're watching it on television. So hopefully our guys in the back are walking around. Dan, if you want to come here. And when we're ready, I'm going to go. Doors. Come on in. Come on in. Richard L. says, definitely a religious experience. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Yes, it is. So we've got a number of people walking around. So just a little bit, you'll see that the corridor is circular. And that was designed because the main section of the ship was a circle. And it needed you needed your actors to look like they were walking around the ship. Uh, something also about Star Trek that was different than most shows that were filmed then and are filmed now is that all of the sets are connected to the corridor. All of the sets are connected to the corridor. Uh, in most filmmaking, once you finished on a set, you had to walk off set and go to another set and then have to start filming again. Here, everything is connected. So that was a big innovation for Star Trek. And some of the things we'll talk about, Star Trek was also about saving money. I'm not going to go into all the whys and wheres today. That'll be on our next one. But a lot of things that were developed, like the transporter, the communicator, uh, the, the sliding doors, all of that stuff was, was done out of necessity to save money, but all became things that are commonplace today. So we're going to take a little walk. And the first place we're going to go is we're gonna go left and we're gonna walk into Sick Bay. So, welcome to Sick Bay. You can walk right up and be part of the crew. So you can certainly see that the format is exactly the same as you would have seen it in the original series. Uh, Dan and a couple of folks have brought lots of props. So you can see that this looks just like what you would have seen. Um, the uh, the uh, uh, Just let you take it in for a second.
So we talked about the fact that some things are available today and some things are not. So this fabric is no longer available, but this was what they used in the original series. And Vic found a textile maker uh, and used swatches based on um, images, screen caps from the original series. And this was manufactured. This was manufactured. And remember, we said 55 years ago, these things didn't exist. Uh, so for example, on the table, you'll see those spray bottles. Well, that's what they used. They didn't have anything different or more futuristic, but they, so they use spray bottles. Um, I mentioned also that Star Trek was also about innovating. So we know, for example, your cell phone is your communicator. Your cell phone is also your tricorder. So they came up with this idea of having a bio bed where, I'll use this one since we've got a victim in it. <laughs> So you lay down in the bio bed and without anything that was being intrusive, uh, uh, it would scan your body and would display your uh, vital signs up on the monitor. Uh, that's something that's actually being experimented with today. And there are some places that are actually testing that. So you could go and get scanned without anything intrusive and have those in that information at your disposal. And you guys could probably hear the rain in the background. Maybe. Good. Dan, I want to just do one last thing. If you would come right here and just face the corridor. So, folks, this is exactly what you would have seen in the original series. That's if you had a camera back here and you were looking out of sickbay, that's exactly the scene you would have seen. And this was a shot used many times because you can go right from the transporter room through the corridor and run into sick bay if there's an emergency. There you have it. There you have it. Thank you, guys. You feeling better? Yeah, sure. You take care of them? Okay. So we'll come on back out to the hallway. And you'll notice that we have some colored lighting gels, and that's to uh, certainly give the effect of what you would have seen in the original series. Um, again, we're not the Enterprise. We're the Constitution. Uh, so things might not look like you would have seen it in the original Star Trek in some cases, but everything has been built to as close to exacting proportions as possible. So we're going to take a walk and go right. And just in front of our A-frame... We're going to be in the transporter room. And it looks like we just had a group beam in. So you can see we have our uh, engineers here at the console. We'll come take a walk around the back so you can see what the console looks like. And we have the monitors in behind them. We have a, a wall scanner behind them. And if we then look at the transporter uh, pads themselves, um, this is exactly what you would have seen. This is exactly what you would have seen. So the pads themselves, the round circles, are old light lenses. It's a Fresnel lens. Uh, it's about 18 inches wide. We'll talk a little bit about how we know what the dimensions are because the dimensions aren't on the blueprints, just where things are located. Uh, but they're Fresnel lenses. So it's all very cool stuff. Uh, back in the 60s, uh, Fresnel lenses were all over film studios. And so they were easily gotten. So Star Trek stole six of them uh, and used them. Uh, these are resin casts from an original Fresnel lens. Uh, again, and this is something that uh, Vic uh, had access to and decided to, again, make this as exacting to the standards of the original series. 
So the way that uh, people would beam in and out, you'll see those green moray patterns in the background. Uh, there's a fader in the back, a fader switch. And what they would do is they would fade the lights and it would be green and the pods are white. So it would be green, white, green, white, green. And then they'd stop, have the camera locked down. Then your crew member would either get on or off the pad and you do another five. And then basically you have two sets of film, one with a, get, one with a uh, person in it and one without, and you cross fade them. And it looks like somebody's actually beaming in. The next time we get together, we'll tell you how the beam in effect was done. And some of the things that you really have no idea took place on real film 50 years ago. Um, and safe to say that probably isn't anyone, including all of you who are on board, uh, and you are on board, uh, who doesn't know what beam me up means. I think that's become part of our lexicon. And this is where it started. All good? We'll keep on going. So here we are back in the corridor. And we just talked about, or I just mentioned, how do you know what the dimensions of everything are? Well, if you can find some common item that would have been used and know the dimensions of that, you could figure everything out. So if you're building uh, a soundstage like Paramount, you're trying to uh, build it as inexpensively as possible. So you're using uh, whatever it is that you have in the shape and the size that it is. So for example, if you're building these walls, all of these walls, and you go out and you get a piece of plywood, you don't want to cut it to some specific shape because then you'd have to get every one of them. So they use the standard size. And if you've ever done any construction, plywood comes in strip of four feet by eight feet, four by eight. And if you look around, four by eight, four by eight, four by eight, four by eight. If you know that dimension is four by eight, you know that the corridor is eight feet wide. You know that a transporter pod is 18 inches wide. So that's how you come up with the dimensions because if it's a little bit off, it doesn't look right to the naked eye and it doesn't look right to the camera. So you want it as exacting as possible. So we're gonna keep on going. And our next stop is gonna be the briefing room. And we've got our crew assembled. And we're anticipating uh, an emergency from Starfleet. Now some interesting things about the briefing room the briefing room, even in the original series, was a transition room or a swing room. So even though it's set up here as a briefing room, it's also been the chapel where Kirk was marrying a couple in uh, Balance of Terror. Um, and what they did was they would put a wall up here at the door, right here would be a wall. Uh, they put a little platform and uh, a, a place for Kirk to stand, a couple of kneelers, a couple of benches a door over here on the right, and suddenly you had a chapel. It was also a rec room. So you take this table out, you put in some white round tables, some coffee, some playing cards, three-dimensional chess, uh, a food replicator on a side wall, and you, all of a sudden you've got a rec room. So it's been multi-purpose, and that's very important when you're filming because you can't build a set and then just have it hanging out uh, because it doesn't do anybody any good. Plus, we don't necessarily have the funding uh, to build it. We don't, you know, we're, we're a 10,000 square foot facility. Paramount was, I don't know what they were, 50, 100,000 square foot. So they could put things where they belong. They could move things around. They had a better budget than Star Trek Continues or any of our independent films. So um, these rooms became very important and you'll see another one coming up shortly. And hopefully our guys have 
solve all of the problems of the world. Why does he want to know how much latinum does it cost to lease a bunk in the lower decks? How much latinum does it cost? Well, you know, we're pre-latinum. So it's probably about 10 credits. We've had a number of people already throw a tip in our general direction. So thank you very much. Thank you guys very much. We really appreciate it. And again, in some in our in our uh, subsequent walkthroughs, we're going to talk about things that people just don't know. And after 55 years, I learned things that I didn't know. But we're going to save that for another walkthrough. Thank you, guys. So we're coming back out in the corridor. Um, and we've got a crewman climbing to the next deck. Uh, unfortunately, he's just climbing up to the top of the set. Uh, but in, you give the opinion that um, that you have multiple decks, multiple crewmen on board. Uh, one last thing before we leave um, the corridor, you'll see a little tribute up here. If anyone is familiar with Grant Imahara, Grant uh, was one of the hosts of um, Dan. Help me. Mythbusters. Myth, Mythbusters. Uh, and, and he played Sulu in Star Trek Continues for many years. And uh, he um, died suddenly last year. Uh, very unexpected. He was very young. And uh, I decided to dedicate Sulu's quarters in honor of Grant. When he came here right the first day and sat at the navigation console, he was going, oh, my, like to guy, <laughs> and was a blast to work with, uh, absolutely professional. So we were blessed to have him on board. So he is missed. He is missed. Uh, we'll keep on going. And we are going to go left. And we are going to go into auxiliary control. And you can see people working hard here in auxiliary control. Now, you may not have seen auxiliary control very often in the original series, but you might recognize it from the Doomsday Machine. Because when Kirk and the boarding party uh, beamed over to the, uh, constitu the constellation, uh, the bridge was damaged and uninhabitable, if you remember what they said. So they had to run the ship from auxiliary control. And this is what you would have seen. This is definitely what you would have seen. Uh, this is, again, one of our swing rooms or transition rooms. So this has been uh, made into a guest quarters. This has been uh, made into a uh, courtroom. Uh, it becomes multi-purpose. By the way, you can see here that we have uh, one of our lieutenant commanders. Uh, if you uh, know from some scenes that you would have seen in the original series uh, where someone was sending a message uh, via the view screen, that's about what you would have seen. That's about what you would have seen. So we've tried to make places, tried to make effects that we could replicate and use in different situations. We, we lost two crew members here. And we lost two crew members. Can you remind them? I'm not medical. Medical. <laughs> Need medical. By the way, if you see some of these items on the wall, like right here, these are called plantons. And the reason they're called plantons is you find something that looks cool, you paint it and you plant it on the wall and you make it look like it's futuristic. So those are all called plantons. And again, if you look at the background, uh, you might remember you know, Kirk uh, sitting at uh, the forefront here in Aux Control and Scotty and uh, another crewman in the background trying to get uh, aux control and get power back uh, and get phasers going and uh, warp drive. Um, this is where you would have seen it. Now I'll let you take it in just for a minute. And again, if you guys have any questions or any comments, we would certainly appreciate it. Thank you, Anna. All right. So we will keep on going. 
Oh, and by the way, you see this back wall here and you see some effects going on. Uh, this has been many things as, uh, as well. And there was an episode of Dreadnought Dominion that turned this into a bar. Just put a bar here. You see that we talked about the, the white circular tables. So they put a couple of tables out. They put some liquor bottles up on the wall, some glasses. Crewmen sitting here having drinks. So this has become a multi-purpose area. All right. We're going to keep on going. And we're going to walk right across the hall into the captain's quarters. And you might recognize uh, Tyler Donovan. Tyler has played uh, Captain Mason in um, uh, the Avalon Universe episodes. Uh, and he is graciously playing a captain here uh, on our Constitution ship. Uh, but again, you can look around. Uh, if we look to uh, Tyler's right, here's the sleeping quarters. And again, you would have seen that in the original series. You see that same um, material on the bed as used in wall hangings as well. Uh, everything in this quarter uh, has been decorated so that it doesn't look like the Enterprise. Because we're not the Enterprise. The Enterprise belongs to another generation. Uh, but all of this was decorated and all these things were donated uh, by different fans. And so, um, again, I think the question before was, are people volunteers? Everyone's a volunteer. Uh, and I couldn't be happier because without these guys, I wouldn't be able to do this for you today. Captain Mason? So again, in some subsequent episodes, when we do walkthroughs, we're going to tell you some behind the scenes things uh, that you might not have expected or anticipated about how things were done 55 years ago. So we'll keep on going. Here we are at the end of our corridor. And you can see we've got our turbo lift at the end. Uh, you'll notice on the top, just a quick comment, you'll notice on the top that it says turbo lift seven. And if you went back to the briefing room, you would have seen it say briefing room two. And that was just a trick by the original series people uh, to make it look like the ship was bigger, right? If turbo lift seven is here, then there must be a lot of them. Uh, if briefing room two is here, then there must be other briefing rooms. So we, we're talking about lots and lots of space because the ship had 430 people on it. All very cool. More plantons on the wall, more plantons here, plantons there. Uh, if we come to the right, um, so we would green screen that background and that would become the shuttle bay. Uh, but for our purposes, we're just showing you what's here behind the scene. Here's our Jeffrey's tube. And for those of you who recognize the Jeffrey's tube, you'll know that it's uh, a way to get, uh, a back way to get into engineering. And Scotty uh, climbed the Jeffrey's tube and tried to get the transporters online in the doomsday machine to get Kirk off the ship. Uh, you'll notice these pipes, and they are, you know, fake pipes, but you'll notice them on the wall, and some of them have labels on them. Uh, A79 on one, I think B12 on another. They're really meaningless. Those don't mean anything. There is something that means something, and Dan's highlighting it now. And it says GNDN. And that was a joke between the uh, people who constructed the original series. Uh, and uh, it's been used in other TV shows and other movies since. Might have even existed before Star Trek. And GNDN, for those of you who don't know, stands for Goes Nowhere, Does Nothing. And that's the big joke. And by the way, it's called a Jeffrey's Tube because if you know the designer... 
of most of everything on the original series from the ships to the weapons to the, the sets and the tube. It was done by a gentleman named Matt Jeffries. And they needed something that looked like this. So Matt constructed it and they didn't have a name for it. And they said, what do we call it? And they said, well, it's Jeffrey's tube. And that's what stuck. A little tip bit is we did have his brown niece, who is a nurse here for Starship Farragut episode as a crew member. And she learned a lot about the great uncle that she really never knew. Just cool to have family members here, like Rod Roddenberry as well. Exactly. So we'll come this way. And we've got a couple of things here. Now you'll see up here in the front, it says engineering control room. So in the original series, because they had much more space to work with, this is where you would have found engineering. However, because again, we're in a limited square footage here, 10,000 square feet, sounds like a lot, but not necessarily. Uh, you can only put things where they belong. So engineering became the set at the, at the front of the studio. And so we showed you that first, but this is where you would have seen it. Uh, behind me, oh, we actually have someone in the brig. This is our brig because what's a starship, what's a naval ship without having a brig or a jail? Um, something, uh, she, she looks real unhappy. She looks so unhappy being locked away. Um, interestingly enough, and you'll, you'll notice it, um, in today's world, if you're in jail, you have jail bars in front of you, or you have a door in front of you with a little window. Um, the interesting thing about this, and, and we assume it was, was uh, intentional, was that uh, if, there's a, if there's a person here, and can I ask you to just come on up so we could talk to you a little closer face to face? So you can see that you can see her completely. Her, her, her character is not obstructed in any way. So even though she's not happy, we can really see that she's not happy. But you can see that you can see her completely. Very cool. The, the <laughs> oh, tidbit. Those are coasters for cocktails made out of glass. Tidbit. A tidbit. A tidbit. So we've come to the end of the corridor. So we have one big set to show you. And that's next. So I'm going to ask Dan to, as best as you can, back into what we've got here. And maybe you want to hide it behind my shirt. And I'm going to walk here. We faded to black for about two seconds. And here you are. Go ahead, walk right in. And you are on the bridge. And you are on the bridge. And you can see we've got a lot of crewmen up here. And that's the way it really should have been in the original series. And there's our captain in the captain's chair. Here's AT, our first officer. Something that we added just this past May is our main view screen. Before, this was just green screen. And if it was being filmed, they would uh, use CGI to completely fill it in. Uh, but we built our own main view screen. Uh, it is built uh, to look pretty close to exactly like what you would have seen um, on the original set. But this would have moved because this is where your cameras would have been. Uh, and that's where the cameras were in Star Trek Continues and Starship Farragut and all of those. Uh, but now we've got this. And if we needed to, we would pull out that center compartment, that screen, and the cameras would go behind there. So we'll let you take it in for a second.
And hopefully you guys can hear the background sounds on the bridge. And let's just walk around a little bit. So here, in fact, is an auxiliary station. And so we've got members there. This is the science section. This is where you would have found Spock. Um, and we have as close to Spock as we could possibly get. Um, but you'll notice the patterns. You'll notice the blinking lights. Uh, that's what you'd seen, the scanner on the left. Uh, somebody just turned off the scanner. Be careful of the buttons. There you go. Because uh, if you push the wrong button, you blow up the ship. Here's our communications officer. That's where you would have seen Uhura. Sailing frequency open, sir. We've identified a vessel. If we keep walking around, and let's come this way for a second, Dan, so we can get a better view. Oh, red alert sounding. Stand by, I think we have an incoming message from uh, Starfleet. So let me first say uh, kudos to uh, the last ship and Star Trek Enterprise uh, for the footage that we had. And uh, I know we're a little early, and uh, and we appreciate everybody's uh, we appreciate everybody's participation in this. Um, and we would definitely uh, appreciate it. Uh, if you guys would tip us. Uh, and so here we are. All right. Cut. Print it. That's a wrap. We'll get everybody to the bridge. Everybody around. Everybody to the bridge. We want to thank everyone. You can stay right in the chair. Can you stay right in the chair. So you can see all the behind the scenes people here, which is very cool. And, and I couldn't thank them enough. I'm going to come over here on the side and just talk for a minute or two. So um, we do fan weekends once a month here in Kingsland, Georgia. And, uh, you know, I know with the pandemic, traveling is an issue with a lot of people. Uh, certainly there are probably many of you who are not in the United States, and we understand that. Um, but we do fan weekends once a month. We do, usually do a Saturday and a Sunday. Uh, just so you know, we are a not-for-profit organization, so we don't charge people to come to the, the sets and do the walkthroughs. Uh, we don't think that money should be a deciding factor in coming here to see it. We just want people to come here uh, and really absorb it and take it in. Uh, some people come here, and this is like a lifelong dream for them to see this because they never ever thought uh, that they would see this in person in their lifetime. Um, and certainly um, we get, I, I mentioned early on, we get a lot of different, um, a lot of different reactions when you're, when we're here. Um, and then again, if you attend uh, one of our fan weekends, if you like what you see, uh, then we would appreciate donations. 
uh, but donations only go to rent and utilities and help us keep the lights on. A uh, couple of quick links that you guys might want to know. If you want to see a little bit more of what we're about, you can visit our webpage at uh, neutralzonestudios.com. Uh, there are also some links on there to help support us. So you can support us through Patreon uh, or you can support us through PayPal. Um, we talked about Star Trek Continues. Uh, and, and basically what Star Trek Continues was, uh, was it was Vic's vision to do the last two years of the five-year mission. So season four and season five of the original series and then leaves off as to where everybody is when you get to Star Trek the motion picture. Um, but, and in that, you can go to Star Trek Continues.com. Again, everything we're talking about is free. So the price is right. The price is 100% right. Uh, but you can go online and you can find Starship Farragut. You can find Dreadnought Dominion. You can find Tales from the Neutral Zone. You can find Avalon Universe. And, you know, you can look for the independence and just put in Star Trek fan film and you'll get a whole host of things coming up. Some that were filmed here, some that weren't, but it doesn't really matter. People are for the love of Star Trek come here to do what they do. And it's my pleasure to be able to, you know, give these walkthroughs to maintain the studio, um, to have these volunteers that are behind us because without these guys, None of this would be possible. None of this would be possible. So first thing is, everybody give yourself a round of applause. And the second thing is, if you guys would give a round of applause to our viewers, I would appreciate it. Thank you guys for being here. Okay. If you care to and you were happy with what you saw today uh, and you can give us a tip, we'd really appreciate it. Uh, our next walkthrough is next Saturday, 9 a.m. Eastern time. And we will do the normal walkthrough that we do. Uh, and we will talk about lots of behind the scenes stuff, lots of things you didn't know. And our third one is, I believe it's on December 11 or 12. It's, it's on Hago already. And that one will be, uh, the walkthrough will be done by Vic Mignana. Uh, who I've talked about here, who's really the force that created this, certainly the force behind Star Trek continues. So without uh, a doubt, thank you guys for being with us. And I guess the last thing we just want to say is if everybody would join me, everybody, live long and prosper. Thank you guys. Really appreciate it.